I'm going to talk to you about curing rare diseases in, in children. For, for those of you who aren't, aren't um, uh, familiar with the field, we, we currently think that there are probably about 7,000 rare diseases. Um, and that translates into an estimate of approximately uh, 1 in 10 in the US, 30 million Americans affected. So individually they are rare, collectively a common cause of disease and often a severe disease. And the vast majority of these rare diseases do not have a treatment, do not have a therapy. Probably 95 plus percent of these are uh, untreated. Now, our efforts to cure these diseases, because the vast majority of these are genetic in origin, our efforts to cure these have really paralleled advances in genetics over the last 50, 60 years. Um, and uh, you'll be familiar with many of these major advances. So what I thought I would do to start with is just to illustrate with regard to one disease, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a severe uh, fatal childhood rare disease, uh, where Oxford has played a major role, how, how this progress has unfolded over the last 50 years. Um, so back in uh, the early 1950s, it was known that this was an X-linked genetic disease that affected boys, but little else was known. And it was only with the early developments in genetics, particularly the advent of recombinant DNA technology and DNA sequencing, that it became possible in the early 1980s to identify the precise location of the gene that causes uh, DMD. Uh, and in the late 1980s, through positional cloning methods, the gene itself was actually uh, discovered, uh, the dystrophin gene. And this led to then characterization of the dystrophin protein, uh, and a related gene and protein called eutrophin. And a particular giant in this field uh, is our colleague Kay Davies, who has made major contributions right from the beginning of the 1980s to the present day in helping to elucidate the causes of the disease and to lay the foundations for developing a, a therapy. So therapeutic efforts in earnest to develop gene-based therapies for this disease began in the early 2000s, and that's when we started to make a contribution to the field. And there were these two studies um, that we were involved in, clinical studies. The first, a study to correct the disease locally within a single muscle. And I'll tell you more about the disease in a second. And the second, where we'd deliver the drug intravenously to attempt to correct the entire disease. And this is a drug which is called an oligonucleotide drug, but it's a programmable RNA therapeutic drug. Um, we did this with the support uh, of many organizations, but particularly the Muscular Dystrophy, Muscular Dystrophy UK. And this really laid the foundation for the approval of the very first genetic medicine for Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy uh, in 2016, working in partnership with a company based in Boston called Sarepta Therapeutics. This drug, Etiplersin, was approved by the FDA in 2016. So this um, absolutely major landmark in the field. Unfortunately, this drug doesn't work very well. Um, the missing gene and protein is dystrophin, so the drug is intended to replace the missing protein, and this drug barely replaces 1% of the missing protein. So despite more than a decade's effort, this drug's efficacy is, is very poor. Um, now, there are reasons why this is such a tough uh, disease to tackle. Um, I mean, the, the FDA uh, briefing document from that uh, first drug, etiplersin, suggested that about 10% of dystrophin, replacing 10%, was probably about the minimum that would be needed to have a clinical impact in the disease. Um, one can debate that figure, but that's what's in the FDA documents. And there are several reasons why this is such a tough target. The dystrophin gene is the largest in the genome, so it's a huge gene, which makes correcting it or replacing it particularly challenging. Dystrophin is required throughout life, so this really emphasizes the need to be able to identify patients early and also for lifelong treatment, which for genetic-based therapies is often challenging. And crucially, the disease, which is a muscle-wasting degenerative disease primarily, affects every single muscle group, including cardiac muscle and the nervous system. So this is uh, a very tough challenge in terms of delivery of these genetic treatments, and therefore delivery has proved a major obstacle to developing successful gene-based therapies for this disease. Now, where we are in 2022 
is that there are now four approved drugs, but they're all first-generation RNA-based drugs of the same type that I've described. So they don't work particularly well, but that's the top four. But there is now a very rich pipeline of follow-on second-generation and other gene therapy drugs. So this is an astonishing effort, uh, where 10 years ago we had nothing, and now we have a pipeline of, of drugs such as this. Uh, our team has played a role in developing this drug second from the bottom with a company called Wave Life Sciences. We helped to do all the preclinical work for that. But more importantly, I think, we, with investment from Oxford Sciences Enterprises, have uh, developed technology that improves the delivery of these drugs and have developed a company called PepGen. And the first drug being developed by this company is now in phase one uh, in this pipeline. Uh, and this really is a technology to facilitate delivery of these types of genetic drugs to muscle, heart, and brain, and therefore is a platform that could be applicable to many, many other rare diseases if this proves to be successful. A second very different type of story I wanted to tell you is, is about another disease uh, where we in Oxford have played a role, and that's spinal muscular atrophy. So this is a, a particularly nasty uh, severe neuromuscular disease that in its severest form um, affects neonates and these children can expect to die within the first year or two of their lives. So this is a, a very severe early onset genetic disorder. But having said that, it's also a disease that is uh, applicable to or susceptible to development of an RNA, programmable RNA therapy. And uh, an oligonucleotide-based therapy for this disease was developed in approximately five years, from 2011 through to 2016, when this drug, Spinraza or Nisinersen, was approved by the FDA. So this is a very short timeline, about five years from the preclinical work to an approved FDA-approved drug. Um, we've, we've played a role in some of the preclinical work, but an important role has been played by our Oxford colleague now, uh, Laurent Servet, who... Despite Brexit and the pandemic, we were able to persuade to move from, from Belgium to Oxford, uh, again with the help of Muscular Dystrophy UK. And Laurent has been involved in leading many of these clinical studies, uh, participating in, but leading now, many of these clinical studies, uh, particularly for spinal muscular atrophy and other neurological diseases. And I want to just show you um, uh, a video. Uh, this is one of Laurent's videos of one of his patients. So this is a patient... Uh, who by all accounts should really not be alive, um, dead by two years old, but treated, and not only does not have any obvious neuromuscular disease, is very much alive, physically active, you know, co virtually completely normal. And I could run this video for quite a while, which, which, I, which I won't do. Um, she climbs up on the table. This is virtually a normal child. So this is, unlike muscular dystrophy, where it's proved to be extremely hard to develop an effective therapy, this drug is administered locally through the intrathecal route to these patients, and this is, this is the result. Now, the reason why this patient is, has responded so positively to treatment um, is because she was identified pre-symptomatically. And this now really highlights the, uh, the new paradigm for how we can treat these diseases, is to prove that a drug works in an affected patient and then rapidly move to treating pre-symptomatic patients if we can identify them. And so this highlights the importance now of, of newborn screening. And Laurent has been you know, one of the major leaders now in the UK trying to develop uh, better and improved and, uh, newborn screening programs. You know, this starts by developing the evidence to show that, that this will be beneficial um, and then working you know, through a very difficult system in the UK to increase the number of diseases that we screen for in newborn children, which currently is only a handful of diseases, uh, where, whilst there are therapies that would benefit um, many other diseases. But the future probably looks something like this. I mean, Laurent in Belgium now has a system where they're able to screen for 123 diseases, I think, in Belgium. Um, so this is getting to over 100. And now um, there is a, a, a major effort about to start from Genomics England where there will be a pilot newborn whole genome screening program launching probably later this year. So one can think about going from perhaps less than 10 diseases that we screen for through to 100 uh, and, then, and then to thousands. 
Um, as, and this will become critically important as new therapies are developed and, and are approved. The other thing that uh, we have done with the advent of these genetic therapies, in other words, with the realization that we can develop treatments for these diseases, is to really tackle this in a, in a serious way. Um, and to do this, we've established a rare disease center with our partners and colleagues from Cleveland, the Harrington Discovery Institute. So this is the Oxford Harrington Rare Disease Center, which has now been running for a couple of years, which is absolutely focused on this business of, of developing new treatments. So the vision for what we're aiming to do is to combine our research excellence here in Oxford with the extraordinary drug development capabilities uh, from Cleveland in the US um, to, to really tackle these rare genetic diseases worldwide. And the goal, the immediate goal, is to develop 20 drugs over the next 10 years. That's our minimum target. Um, and to benefit potentially a minimum of 350 million people worldwide who are suffering from these types of rare disease. So that's the goal, is to develop, uh, is absolutely focused on development of rare disease medicines. And the way we do that now is by focusing on uh, a number of major areas. The first one is rare brain diseases. Almost 50% of rare diseases affect the nervous system. Uh, so this is a very obvious area to focus on. Uh, a second one on the right-hand side is cancer. Um, not as many rare cancers as there are rare brain diseases, but many of these are very, very severe and life-limiting. So we have a focus on cancer. And then a third category of developmental disorders. Here we're thinking about uh, cardiac and neurodevelopmental disorders, but, but a number of other types of developmental rare diseases as well. And it's crucial for us to, in this endeavor to be working with partners, whether it be foundations such as Muscular Dystrophy UK, Genomics England, the new Institute of Developmental and Regenerative Medicine here in Oxford, uh, partners in Birmingham to, to trial cancer therapies. All of these partners will be crucial to our efforts. Uh, one of the other things that we're in the process of developing is what we've called a rare disease accelerator, which this will enable us with the expertise and the financing to hopefully reach our target of developing at least 20 drugs. The last brief story I want to tell you is uh, about ultra-rare diseases. And you'll recall at the start of the talk, I told you that there, uh, it's commonly thought that there are about 7,000 rare diseases. Well, a study from, uh, published just very recently from a colleague of ours, uh, Ted Smith at Karolinska, uh, has done some mathematical modeling of this. And the number that he estimates is somewhere between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 6 rare disease. Probably about 200 to 300,000 rare diseases, not, not 7,000. So there are an extraordinary number of these, and he's coined the new term here, hyper-rare diseases. Now, many of these will be extremely uncommon, uh, but nevertheless, they exist. There will be unmet need, and we will need to find a way to develop treatments for them. And so this is where we are developing... Uh, collectively in the field, a concept of N equals 1 and how we would develop a treatment for a single patient with a rare disease. And this concept has really um, been pioneered uh, by Tim Yu, shown on this slide, um, a colleague and a collaborator of ours at Boston Children's, who uh, published this uh, landmark paper a, a couple of years ago where he had developed a custom genetic treatment, an oligonucleotide-based RNA therapy, for a single patient with a rare epilepsy, a, small, uh, a child. And the timeline to do this was from late 2016 through to 2018. In other words, from first seeing the patient, approximately 18 months later, there was a medicine for that single patient. So this is a new paradigm. Uh, you can probably immediately see many of the challenges related to this paradigm. But nevertheless, it's something that we are uh, determined to build here in Oxford, uh, not least because of the enormous unmet need, and it will be academic centers like ours that need to grapple with this challenge and to think about how we can do this successfully. So my last slide really is, is this one, is, is really thinking about where the future of therapy development is for these rare, rare diseases. And on the left-hand side will be the importance, but the, the likelihood of us being able to identify these diseases pre-symptomatically at low cost through whole genome sequencing. So identifying patients very early uh, who would benefit from treatment. 
Uh, and this is already beginning to happen. And with newborn screening and, and other ways of doing this, we can, we can see that this will, this will happen soon. The second part is developing the therapy. Um, and on the previous slide, I, uh, that therapy for a single patient was 18 months. The therapy I told you earlier about for spinal muscular atrophy was five years. What we, what we need to do and what we're in the process of thinking through is how do we reinvent this drug development uh, process for rare diseases such that we could have a drug uh, for a rare disease or a hyper-rare disease developed in a few months, one to three months. And this will involve you know, conceptual rethinking but also technological development to enable us to do this and to do it cost-effectively. And then increasingly, as a result of you know, uh, pre-symptomatic diagnosis, we will be able to uh, stratify the patient groups and eventually treat smaller and smaller groups of patients, most likely, with very precisely developed genetic therapy, so-called precision medicine. So that's the vision for the, the next, I said, uh, 50 years. I, I think this will probably happen within the next 10 to 20 years, most likely. Um, and uh, we're determined in the pediatrics department in Oxford to play a major role in doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. I think with this timeline, we can at least expect at the 100th <laughs> birthday of the department to see some really step-changing um, new therapies, but hopefully, and more realistically, much, much earlier. Any questions? Thanks for the very engaging uh, presentation, Matthew. Just a question for me is, so the, the cost associated with developing some of these um, genetic therapies ranks amongst some of the most expensive. So I'd be interested to hear from you how we're going about addressing some of those cost challenges. Yes, I mean, it's, um, I mean, these are amongst the most expensive treatments. And I think when you're thinking about these being for rare disease, so for small numbers of patients, and currently there are relatively few approved drugs, you know, I think many uh, healthcare systems can probably manage the cost. Uh, but the, the future, where there will be hundreds of approved drugs um, for many different diseases and, and tens if not hundreds of thousands of patients will be, will be unmanageable. Um, so I think a lot of this is about, um, you know, having a proper, um, health economic view of this, because many of the, these treatments actually save money. Um, I mean, Laurent is repeatedly making the case that newborn screening saves money, identifying patients early, keeps patients out of hospital, keeps them away from requiring you know, all sorts of expensive interventions. Uh, so many of these will save money, but I think it'll be technical developments, you know, not just being able to develop these drugs more cheaply, but these genetic drugs, scaling up the production, inventing new ways of making these drugs, I think bring, bringing down the time and the cost of producing these drugs, um, you know, will, will make a difference. But it's, you know, I think we're going to be stuck with high prices probably for the, for the next, you know, five to ten years. Thank you very much. Matthew?